hello everyone. I hope you're all having a great virtual conference. Many of you will recognise the building behind me, my normal abode of Perth Museum and Art Gallery. At this end we see the, the Pantheon-like temple building uh, with the statue of the benefactor Hay Robertson which formed the Rotunda or the first public museum in Perth which was set up by the Perth Literary and Antiquarian Society in the 1820s. Attached to it at this end we see the 1936 extension uh, uh, built by Perth Town Council. Uh, by that time the museum service was a local authority museum service as it is today. For the past five years Perth and Kinross Council has been developing and implementing a plan to refurbish this existing building, to create a new collection store and to develop a new building, a, a new museum I should say. And it's that third element and its archaeological contents, as we th think they may be, that I'm going to talk to you today. We've wandered across town uh, into the historic core of Perth and where we're now stood outside the, the Edwardian City Hall of Perth where for many decades the, uh, the young people of Perth enjoyed memorable musical performances. As I say, it's in the historic core of the town and it sits adjacent to the uh, parish kirk of St John the Baptist, which has been here for something like a thousand years. The concert hall, as was, is the proposed venue for the new museum for Perth and Kinross. Uh, that museum will tell the archaeological story of Perth and Kinross from the end of the Ice Age through to yesterday. And that's what I'm going to say a little bit more about now. So, essentially, what I'm talking about today is the creation of three interconnected gallery spaces with a chronological sweep from the Mesolithic to the 17th century, from 10,000 BC to 1650 AD. The first part will tell the story of Perth and Kinross from around 10,000 BC to AD 1000, so through to the foundation of the Kingdom of Alba. The second sweep will cover 1000 to 1650 AD, focusing on later medieval times and the town of Perth in particular. The third element is the Stone of Destiny, which works to connect the two halves. There are two key elements to this. The first is the building challenge, i.e. converting a historic building so that it can function as a museum. And the second is the collections challenge, ensuring the safe, accessible and inspiring redisplay of relevant collections in this new space. Adapting the building is well underway. The huge concert organ has been dismantled and shipped to Australia. A new concrete floor has been laid with archaeological evaluation of course, and all the seats have been removed. The process will create a new access of a venal between two opposing entrances and will see the creation of a white box pavilion inside the main hall, which you can see on this slide. The collections challenge, in summary, for archaeology can be divided into two sections the Stone of Destiny and the Perth Museum and Art Gallery collections. The inclusion of the pavilion feature within the former City Hall is aimed at creating a sort of inner sanctum space where it is hoped that the Stone of Destiny can be displayed. Negotiations around this have been running for over three years now and we are currently awaiting the outcome of a Scottish Government-led public consultation inviting views as to whether the stone should be displayed here in Perth or should remain at Edinburgh Castle. Ultimately, the decision is for the Queen and her advisers. In terms of the existing Perth collections, the key issues they throw up are around display and interpretation strategies, environmental issues and conservation issues. The design process is well underway and has involved us producing detailed object lists 
work, working up display specification in consultation with metaphor and conservation colleagues and mapping out the areas of detailed interpretation that we need to pursue. Working with the design company Metaphor, we spent a lot of time mapping out the gallery themes and the interrelationship of the permanent and temporary galleries. Metaphor used their experience of audience mapping to think about visitor flows through the spaces. And in the, uh, the, the image on the left of this slide, you can see some of those flows indicated with, with the red line. That process has given us two floors of galleries, the ground floor archaeological display and the later story of Perth on the first floor. I'll come back to elements of this, but for now I want to turn to my second theme around what's new in museum archaeology displays and how we've been looking there for inspiration. There have been many scales of project over the last 10 years or so and I just want to single out a few uh, of the many more worth mentioning. So I'll briefly look at three museums and two examples of archaeological display and interpretation. Though on a large physical scale, this uh, exciting new museum uh, highlighted in this slide, uh, Aarhus in Denmark, is rooted in what we might call a folkloric intimacy with the human occupation of the land. It is rooted in place, and the human stories it can tell. It opened its final in a sequence of permanent galleries towards the end of 2017. Its innovative, landscape-conscious architecture is fused with the deployment of technology. Rather than give visitors tablets to guide them around, the displays are peppered with large digital screens through which curators talk to visitors if they want to follow up details on the collections and their interpretation. The House of European History in Brussels, in Belgium, is a new museum initiative of the European Parliament and opened in 2017. Based in Brussels, it draws from collections around Europe. Its permanent galleries, spread over four floors, dispense with conventional labelling, issuing visitors with headsets and tablets so that they can explore objects in as much detail as they like. The innovative inaugural temporary exhibition, Interactions, includes, for example, a digital installation called Tracking My Europe, via which visitors can input data on their own experiences and cross-cultural preferences, where they live, where they holiday, and from where their favourite food, music and sports clubs come all displayed on an interactive digital map of Europe. The merging of all responses made creates an ever-changing collective web of interactions. The museum's bed of dreams, exploring the pan-European role of fairy tales, is equally innovative. The museum's inclusive approach also makes room for more conventional interaction using paper and pens, as we can see here. My final uh, three of the three museums is the Musée des Confluences at Lyon in France. This is primarily a natural history museum incorporating mankind into that particular framework. It asserts a shared, variegated, global identity rooted in both the scientific and the folkloric or, if you like, mythopoetic understanding of life. And it really is a fantastic new building. I've now turned to a couple of examples on this on a smaller scale. First, the extension of the Amsterdam Metro, built between 2002 and 2012, including new stations at Rokin and Amsterdam Central. In advance of its construction, a section of the River Amstel through Amsterdam had to be pumped out and excavated. As a result, 700,000 objects were recovered, 
mostly spanning the 13th to the 20th century. A little short of 20,000 of these objects have been put on display at Roken Station, opening to the public in July 2018. They were placed in long cases at either end of the platform, each between the up and down escalators. There's no labelling of any kind, just a mass of typologically arranged objects that make a startling impact. The huge, huge mass of these objects has a very humanising effect. It gives us an immediate sense of lives lived in the city in a complex network or web of interconnections. The displays are supported on site by mosaic images on the walls of the station and online by a website called Beneath the Surface. Here you can look up basic data on any of the 20,000 objects on display by simply clicking on that object's photograph. You can also read about the history of the project and watch a documentary. More innovatively, you can also take a selection of objects and rearrange them to create your own virtual collection and exhibition and share it on the website. Though the scale was slightly less, both in terms of its development project, a new high-rise office block, and its archaeological foundations, the Roman Mithraeum, the Bloomberg space in London uh, <clears throat> adopted a similar digital technology approach. The Mithraeum was originally discovered back in the 1950s and relocated by a few metres in the face of redevelopment. As part of the 2010 to 2017 development, it was, re 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 it was re reconstructed almost exactly where it had been originally found as a ruin beneath the new office block. The ruins themselves are presented with a dramatic form of engagement through a digital light and sound show that brings back the Mithraeum as a place of exclusive interaction and mysterious drama. Before or after touring the Mithraeum, uh, there's an interactive space where the visitor can engage with the Roman world context of Mithraeums, where a series of digital screens enable a detailed exploration of Mithraism and the locations of other Mithraeums. At ground floor level, a large vertical wall case displays 600 of the finds from the excavation led by the Museum of London. Digital tablets are available which enable visitors to explore each object in detail. The same information is available on the website London Mithraeum Bloomberg Space. Within debates about the cultural value of archaeology and heritage, all of this comes within the orbit, orbit sorry, of the turn towards social value and its assessment, where the concern is with tangible fabric, the surviving traces of buildings, objects and material manifestations, and the intangible and social dimensions of cultural heritage. What these exhibitions also share is the creativity embedded in assembling and reassembling collections, whether by curators or visitors and in real and in virtual contexts. Some, some of the ideas that have informed the projects I've been talking about briefly and others we have trialled in several recent temporary exhibitions hosted at Perth Museum and in conjunction with various partners. And you can see uh, the posters for those exhibitions here. Hopefully some of you will have visited them. So at this point I want to uh, turn to my uh, third theme and return to the implementation of these and other ideas in the context of a new museum for Perth, which will see us transition from a relatively small display of the region's archaeology to one where more archaeology is on display that, than has been thus far in the three century spanning existence of the museum. So what we are looking at at this stage is a ground floor divided essentially into two galleries. The first covering the Mesolithic to the Picts and the other looking at medieval Perth and its hinterland. Linking the two will be the hoped for display of the Stone of Destiny, which I will come back to. So far, uh, <clears throat> our thinking uh, around the first gallery 
uh, has it weaving a post Ice Age narrative of the land and its resources, the movement of people and the transition of Pictish kingdoms to the kingdom of Alba in the 10th century AD. So the structure is basically chronological but supported by thematic content with some compromises around space and flow for very large objects like the Carpu Bronze Age logboat. The headings and text shown here are not final, merely indicative, but certainly reflective of what is in the collections. And I hope you can, they are quite small, I hope you can read uh, those headings on that, on that diagram and on the subsequent diagrams. The second gallery follows on from the Stone of Destiny display and is essentially structured around the story of medieval Perth, encompassing such as how the town began, its shape and evolution, the craft base, food and drink, health and hygiene, pleasure and pain, death and burial, and religion and belief. Both the formal church infrastructure and the more personal, heterogeneous sets of beliefs lending faith and magic. Amongst the big nar narrative ideas aired in recent years are those around exchange, movement, networks and connectivity. And I've shown you examples of some of those in the other museum projects I, I whizzed through uh, earlier. They also crop up in some major temporary exhibitions which are also now defining ways in which digital technologies can give a greater reach through animations, 3D recordings and databases. But we can also see some of the ideas I have mentioned at work at the scale of individual objects that help to key in the local to the international. And I have four brief examples to conclude with. The Stone of Destiny, Neolithic Jadeite axe heads, Bronze Age beakers and human facial reconstructions. The Stone of Destiny is pivotal in exploring issues around kingship. It is an object with a rich biographical trajectory and we would hope to situate it within its most well-known king-making event, that of Ale King Alexander III in 1249. I'll say no more about that here as the project is still pending a final decision by the Queen's Commissioners. In recent years, there has been a pan-European project to analyse the use of alpine rock to create prestigious axe heads in the Neolithic and seeking to trace their production, movement, biographical trajectories uh, and so on across Europe. There are four such axe heads from Persia and we hope, we hope to borrow two of them from, from the National in Museum in Edinburgh, Edinburgh sorry, so as to tell that story uh, which in its details has been worked out by, by Alison uh, at the National Museum. One of the fastest changing areas of archaeological research currently is that of ancient DNA, with many of its results still preliminary and sometimes misguided. Each new study seems to rewrite the narrative, but in essence, for remoter prehistory, we seem to be de developing a picture of large-scale east-to-west movements of people hitherto disparaged in preference for the exchange of ideas only through chains of what we might call entangled peoples. One consequence of this is that the beaker phenomenon is once more about the movement of people and not just pots. The NMS-led analysis of ceramics and associated human remains has revealed that beakers from Ben Laws and New Mill, for example, are linked to the movements of the same group of people originating in the Mars Valley area of the Low Countries. In a fast-moving research area such as this, we are also thinking about how to tell stories that might change very rapidly, certainly in comparison with the life expectancy of a major new gallery. Another growth area in archaeological interpretation in recent years is also directly related to people. 
the facial reconstruction of individuals based on the forensic anthropological analysis of skulls. This particular chap uh, is a Pictish man of the 5th century from a kiss burial in Blair Athol in Highland Persia and analysed by Haley Fisher. Within the redevelopment project, we are planning uh, to have seven or so facial reconstructions throughout the displays. In some instances, these will accompany the skeletal remains. In others, there will be the skull accompanied by a 3D or 2D digital reconstruction. These will include a Bronze Age woman, an Egyptian mummy priestess, a man and a woman from medieval Perth, and hopefully a couple of dogs from medieval Perth too. Pets are essential. So no overarching conclusion at this stage, but just an affirmation that we are seeking to tell tales about people living in Persia across 12 millennia and with global connections through sensorially engaging, biographically nuanced objects and reflecting new, ongoing research. I've not said anything about budget constraints, engagements and partnerships, but hopefully I have said enough to encourage any comments about any aspect of our project or its glaring omissions. Thank you for listening.